Hello everyone, this is Giacomo speaking. Welcome again to the new to the new event of the ISO IPATIA colloquium. Let me remind you, this is a special colloquium dedicated to early career astronomer. Um, we every time we would like to congratulate with uh, the our speakers because they passed through a very very um, competitive selection process, and we are very very pleased to hear about the scientific. Uh, work that the the the, our, the early career astronomers, so the youngest generation, they are doing these days. So thank you for being with us. And uh, the event of today is going to be chaired by uh, Francesca and Camila. They are a fellow and a student of ISO. They, they every as as it's happening now every time, they are very very kind and they are helping us chairing this session the fellow, our fellows and students we are very proud of this and so they are helping also to making to make this event so successful and so and so enjoyable actually so thank you so for for me just very very quickly technical uh, points that you, you are all probably very familiar with this but just let me re repeat very quickly so you there are two ways to join the, the series one via uh, zoom and the link is sent to the ones who register on our IPATIA pages. The others can join, the, the, otherwise you can join and, and participate to the, to, the, um, to the seminar by watching the live streaming available on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Um, the questions to the speaker, so the speaker had 20 minutes, more or less 20 minutes lot. After that, there will be a question and answer session uh, moderated by the chairs of the, of the, of the event. And uh, uh, you can, if you are on Zoom, you can make a question directly yourself and the chair will give the word to you. Just use the, the function, raise your hand so that you can, and the, and the chat basically internally, you can just make uh, clear that you want to make a question so the chair can give you the word. On the other side, if you are on YouTube, you can make your question using the live chat on YouTube. In case you want, you don't, you're not um, you know, comfortable in making, uh, the question on YouTube, then you can also use a questionnaire that we have available on our IPATIA web pages. If you search for ISO IPATIA web pages, you can see there is a pro on the right, right hand side, there is a menu where you can uh, questionnaire with a questionnaire, then you can go to this questionnaire, you make the question and basically you send it and we, and we received it live and, and, and you can pass it to the speaker. And that's for in case you don't have a YouTube account or you, or you don't want to leave your, your question on YouTube. It is, please consider, this is for the, the people on YouTube, please consider there is always a delay of 30 seconds, more or less, between the time when the event is happening live and the time uh, the, the time you see the event on YouTube. Uh, so maybe it's, it, it can happen for, for, reason, for this reason or for also reason of time that some of the questions are not directly answered, immediately answered, but it is very, very important that the question is still if you have a question, you can make it on your YouTube channel because this way the speaker can see uh, the, the question and they can answer later, they can, they can contact you. And remember that they can also contact yourself, the speakers by, 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 what, by you can basically, if you go to our pages on the, on the program, you can, if you see the, the entire program, you go to, to, to the, you can see the titles and you click on the title, you immediately can download the PDF with the, with the abstract, the picture of the, of the speakers and the uh, curriculum vitae, so you can also contact them directly. Uh, also remember that this uh, video stays online, so you can watch it later as well. Um, that's the other thing I wanted to remind, just, just uh, we are very happy that other people are doing similar, other institutes are doing similar events, and there is in particular in Australia, there is a, a similar seminar going on. So feel okay enjoy the we are very happy that this is happening around the world and, and this because we we are really uh, we know and we do what we can to support we know that this that the, the early career scientists these days have been very little chances to to con get in touch with the community so this event like the like Patia or others like the australian community is doing they are made to, as a platform to also give visibility to our um, early career scientists, and we are very happy that this is happening uh, around the world. So having said that, uh, I'd like to give the word to Francesca. I think that she will introduce our speakers and uh, enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Francesca Frangudi. It's really a pleasure to be hosting uh, today's Ibatia Colloquium. 
together with Camila de Safreitas, who is also co-hosting with me and is a PhD student at ESO. I'm a fellow at, at ESO. Um, so our speakers today, you can see them here. And our first speaker today is Adrian Bittner, who will be telling us about the properties of nuclear structures that are found at the centers of barred galaxies. Adrian is currently finishing his uh, PhD at ESO. He's about to defend soon. And before starting his PhD, Adrian did his bachelor's and master's at the University of Munich. And he also traveled halfway around the world um, to Chile, where he carried out a six month research project at ESO for his master's. So um, Adrian, I give you the floor. You can share your screen and please take it away. Um, awesome. Thanks a lot, Francesca, for the nice introduction. And also for me, it's a pleasure to be here today and provide you a short, but hopefully very exciting overview about some of the things I've been doing during my PhD, some of the recent results of the timer survey. So what we'll be looking at today are the stellar kinematics and stellar population properties of some bar built nuclear structures in these galaxies, so-called nuclear disks and nuclear rings. And we will also have a bit of closer look at what we can actually learn from these kinematics and population measurements about their formation and evolutionary history. But now, before actually having a closer look at these components, I would like to start a little bit more basic, namely by giving you a bit of an overview about bars in disk galaxies. Bars, these um, yeah, strongly non-axisymmetric and rigidly rotating stellar components in the centers of many disk galaxies, they are not only quite pretty, at least in my honest opinion, but they are also very frequent. In the local universe, around two thirds of all disk galaxies do host bars. And although this bar fraction is um, yeah, decreasing with increasing redshift, there is still quite some bars being around early on with 10% of the galaxies at set equals one having strong bars and the very first bars being observed as early as redshifts of 2D. Now, these bars are not only pretty, they are not only frequent, they have not only been around for a very long time, but they are also one of the major drivers of secular evolution in these galaxies. They have various different effects on these galaxies, enhancing star formation in some regions, suppressing star formation in others, um, facilitating the formation of these beautiful rings. But for today, for this talk, I would like to focus on um, one particular process, namely the bar driven gas inflow from the main galaxy disks to the central regions. Yeah, so what happens there is that, the, that this strongly non axisymmetric potential of the bar exerts tangential forces on the gas in the main galaxy disk. This gas, yeah, then subsequently shocks, it loses angular momentum, and it has no other choice but to stream inward, and it eventually ends up falling along the leading edges of the bar towards the galaxy center. Yeah, this bar-driven gas inflow is a process that's not only very well reproduced in numerical simulation, but it can also nicely be observed. Here in this image, we see the galaxy NGC 1097 in an HST observation. And here, these dust lanes along the leading edges of the bar nicely highlight this gas inflow. However, this gas inflow does not um, yeah, immediately continue to the very centers of these galaxies, it does not immediately feed uh, the central black hole, but instead this gas inflow is halted in the central region a couple of hundred parsecs from the galaxy center. There the gas settles, it dissipates, it cools, and then eventually goes ahead to form an additional stellar component. Yeah, there is new stellar substructures forming in the centers of these galaxies something we can also nicely see here in this image um, as, the, as there is a very yeah, star forming, almost star bursting nuclear ring. Yeah, the structures that form there in the galaxy centers, um, there's three main types of these structures. There's nuclear rings, nuclear disks, and inner bars. Nuclear rings, 
as the name suggests, yeah, they morphologically appear to be rings, so they have a rather well-defined inner and outer edge. And in between, there is quite often, yeah, a lot of gas with ongoing star formation and star bursting episodes. Nuclear disks, once again, as the name suggests, they yeah, more appear to be disks, so they have an outer edge, but they extend throughout the centers of the galaxy and are typically mostly um, stellar components. The third type um, are inner bars. And although that's not the topic of my talk today, it's a quite curious situation in which a smaller a inner bar uh, develops within these nuclear disks. And that leaves us with this very curious situation of having a large scale main bar being located in the main disks of these galaxies, while at the same time, at a smaller scale, a tiny inner bar uh, is located within the nuclear disks. It's a very interesting topic. And also in Timer, we've been looking at this quite a bit with two papers already being published two years ago. And I have published yet another one earlier this year. But unfortunately for today, I would like to focus on the nuclear rings and nuclear disks. Now, before having a closer look at them, I mentioned the timer survey a couple of times already. So let me just briefly introduce timer and the data we do have at hand. Well, the timer survey, it's a survey of the central regions of 21 um, disk galaxies, all of them being yeah, located in the local universe, all of them being strongly barred, all of them showing a variety of these central substructures of nuclear rings, nuclear disks, and inner bars. We do have integral field spectroscopic observations for all of them. In fact, we have them observed with everybody's darling with the MU spectrograph. So we can not only get a good impression of their structural properties, thanks to the yeah, high spatial resolution, but also we get the full set of spectroscopic information from which we can extract stellar kinematics, mean stellar population properties, star formation histories, and even do um, an emission line analysis. Yeah, and with this um, tremendous data set consisting of more than 2 million spectra, I think we're in a very yeah, neat and handy situation to have a close look at these bar built structures, investigate their formation, their structure, and their evolutionary histories. Yeah, now with this data at hand, the next thing to do is um, yeah, to start do the data analysis. But please bear with me. I don't want to yeah, bore you with details of the data analysis, but instead just briefly introduce a quite handy tool for the analysis of spectroscopic data I already developed two years ago. It's something we call the GIST pipeline. Yeah, the main idea of the GIST pipeline is to have one easy to use all in one analysis framework for all different kinds of spectroscopic data. In its default setup, the GIST comes along um, equipped with these very well known um, full spectral fitting routines, uh, such as PPXF and Pi Gandalf, to yeah, extract stellar kinematics, stellar population properties, star formation histories, and do an emission line analysis. But in fact, it's in no way specific to these methods. So it's quite straightforward to just rip these out and replace them with alternative analysis methods that might be more suitable um, to the specific science case. In the same way, the GIST is not specific to any instrument um, or model library. And so far, it has not only been used with our um, timer MUSE data, but also with data from Khalifa, from Symfony from CAC with simulated data for the forthcoming Weaves and Harmony instruments. So it's also in that sense, a really, really flexible instrument. Obviously it comes along with a proper parallelization approach, but I think what's much more um, interesting is this graphical user interface. It's something we call the map viewer. The whole point of the map viewer is to yeah, allow a really uh, natural and interactive access to all the high level data products of the GIST. So for instance, one can plot maps 
of the quantities one has measured here we see for instance one of the velocity maps of yeah one of our timer galaxies and by interacting with this map by quite simply clicking at one of the bin one of the bins in there one can access all the underlying data products the observed spectra the fitted spectra residual star formation histories whatever is in there so long story short if you're working with spectroscopic data, if you have a lot of IFU cubes lying around, you might want to give the GIST a try, um, as it's quite simply a very handy tool uh, to analyze um, these observations. So in case you're interested, there's a dedicated paper about this, um, BitNet L 2019. There's also an extensive online documentation. And in case of doubt, you're obviously also very, very welcome to just get in touch with me. Yeah, um, but so much about the basics, so much about the timer survey and our data analysis tool. I think now it's time to finally start and have a closer look at the properties of nuclear disks. Yeah, here on the left, we have plotted maps of the stellar kinematics of one of our timer galaxies. We see maps of the stellar velocity, velocity dispersion, and the two higher order moments, H3 and H4, of the line of sight velocity distribution. Yeah, and I think it's quite uh, straightforward to spot the nuclear disks in these maps. It's quite simply this um, rapidly rotating component here in the very center that's even rotating a little bit faster than the underlying main disk of the galaxy. The nuclear disks also do show up as regions of low velocity dispersion and based on this strong anti-correlation between velocity and H3, um, we uh, yeah, can figure out that the stars in these nuclear disks must be moving more or less on circular orbits. So in summary, Looking at the stellar kinematics of nuclear disks, we see that these are really regularly rotating kinematically cold components. And that's in fact exactly what we would expect in this picture of, bar, of a bar driven formation of these structures where the bar brings gas to the galaxy center slowly and continuously where it first cools, settles, cools, and then forms stars in a well-defined rotational um, uh, configuration. Yeah, moving on to the stellar population properties of nuclear disks, I think it's once again very easy um, to spot the nuclear disk here in these panels of stellar ages, stellar metallicities, and the alpha over FE enhancements. It's clearly this component in the center that's much younger, has much higher metallicities and lower alpha over FE abundances. Why is this? Well, nuclear disks are naturally expected to be relatively younger than their surroundings if they are built by gas brought to the galaxy center um, via a bar. So the formation of a main disk and the bar itself is a prerequisite to the formation of this nuclear disk. So it should be relatively younger. A similar argument applies to um, the metallicities, because if this gas, the nuclear disks are built from, comes from the main galaxy disk, it has most probably been already pre-processed there. And then with the continuous formation of more generation of stars in the galaxy center, this uh, metallicity should also increase. Finally, these alpha over FE enhancements, they are basically a measure of how rapidly and violently um, star formation proceeds. So rapid, short-lived, violent episodes of star formation typically lead to increased alpha over FE enhancements as typically observed in classical bulges and elliptical galaxies, while low alpha over FE enhancements hint towards a slow and prolonged episode of star formation. And that's exactly what we see here for our nuclear disks. So this not only um, contradicts possible ideas of forming these uh, structures 
via accretion events where star formation would be confined to one singular episode, but supports this, again, this bar driven scenario where a bar with a lifetime of multiple giga years slowly and continuously keeps bringing gas to the center. So causing a very slow and extended period of star formation that forms these nuclear disks. Yeah, um, now I've been talking quite a bit about nuclear disks, but in the beginning, I also mentioned that um, there are nuclear rings. So one might wonder what's actually the difference between these nuclear rings and the nuclear disks, and why do some galaxies prefer to host nuclear disks while other galaxies host nuclear rings? And to illustrate this a little better, I brought an overview of two galaxies here. The upper one, that's NGC 1097, a galaxy with a really strong and stereotypical um, nuclear ring. While in the lower panels, we have NGC 4643, a galaxy that has a very nice nuclear disk that shows no sign at all of a nuclear ring. The interesting thing here is that when looking at the maps of the stellar kinematics, we actually can't really tell the difference between those galaxies having nuclear rings and those having nuclear disks. They are all rapidly rotating, they all have low velocity dispersions, and they are basically indistinguishable. However, when looking at the maps of the stellar kinematics, things become more interesting. As I just showed you, for the nuclear disks, yeah, we see them showing up here in the maps of the alpha over the abundances as disks of lower alpha over Fe enhancements. And we do see the very same here in the center of 1097, where alpha abundances is low. But in all of those galaxies that have a nuclear ring, this low alpha disk is encompassed by a ring of significantly different stellar population properties, showing younger ages, showing distinct stellar metallicities, and yeah, elevated alpha over Fe abundances. Why is this? Well, eventually it's just an effect of star formation. And that's something we have illustrated here in the panels on the right where we plot um, the H alpha emission line fluxes. In literally all timer galaxies without nuclear ring, there is very little H alpha emission in the galaxy center. And if there is emission, it has low fluxes. It's rather um, smoothly or randomly distributed. All galaxies with nuclear rings, there, this H alpha emission and there with the star formation is really strongly concentrated in these nuclear rings. And yeah, it basically highlights specifically that spatial region where the bar deposits the inflowing gas. There the gas accumulates, it forms stars. So in a way, nuclear rings can quite simply be understood as the gaseous, the star forming outer edges of nuclear disks with these stellar nuclear disks actually being um, evident in both cases. Yeah, um, that might be a nice realization, but it should also raise another question. Namely, how can we end up with these yeah, continuous nuclear stellar disks if in literally all cases, star formation is yeah, constrained to these gaseous nuclear rings? Um, it's a question that really got me wondering, but in fact, there might be a rather simple or elegant explanation. First of all, we do find, based on our um, kinematic analysis, that the typical radius of these nuclear rings um, correlates with the bar length, with the radii of the bars these um, structures live in. We also know from many previous studies that bars evolve a lot. They tend to grow longer and stronger with time. So just taking these two ingredients and putting them together one might suspect um, the following scenario. 
shortly after the formation of a bar, when it's still rather yeah, short and weak, it should result in the formation of rather yeah, of rather small uh, nuclear rings with very small radii. And later on, as the bar evolves, as it grows longer and stronger with time, the radii of these star forming nuclear rings should also continuously increase. And in this picture, one could imagine that a continuous stellar nuclear disk quite simply forms via a series of um, star forming nuclear rings with ever increasing radii. And in that sense, we um, yeah, would end up with a picture in which these nuclear disks are really built um, in an inside out formation scenario. And what is nice about this is that we can actually see a signature of this in radial profiles of um, the stellar population's properties. If we look here at the um, upper panel, there we have stellar ages as a function of the radius for one of our timer galaxies here. The vertical dashed line uh, highlights the outer edge of the nuclear disk. And there we can clearly see that these nuclear disks are older in their center and become continuously younger towards the outer edge, exactly as one would expect it. Um, in this um, yeah, inside out formation scenario. Also, we find that these um, radial gradients in the population profiles are typically very well defined, having single slopes from the galaxy center to the outer edge. Um, once again, emphasizing that these nuclear disks really seem to be continuous single components um, from the galaxy center. Yeah, um, one last aspect. I mean, I talked a lot about uh, nuclear disks and nuclear rings now, and how nicely we can identify them in our time galaxies just based on their yeah, um, kinematics, on their characteristics of being cold and rapidly rotating, and their yeah, distinct stellar population properties. However, there's one thing we do not find in these galaxies, and that's massive classical bulges. These yeah, dispersion dominated spheroids that are thought to form very early on in the formation, in the formation and evolution of these galaxies. Um, yeah, typically these are thought to be a result of minor merger processes. Now, in our understanding of uh, hierarchical structure formation where larger structures form via the merging of smaller structures. These minor mergers should be rather frequent. So one might expect to find a lot of classical bulges um, in the local universe. Now in timer, we only find one in 21 galaxies and that is actually um, a bit surprising. Sure, in timer, we focus on barred galaxies with nuclear disks because that was our main science goal. But still, it's very massive galaxies. And with MUSE, it should be doable to even detect um, small signatures of these classical bulges. Yeah, so where are they? Um, does this, in a way, um, yeah, challenge our understanding of hierarchical structure formation? Or is there quite simply other processes in galaxy evolution that prevent the formation of classical bulges in minor mergers, say feedback from the AGN or stellar feedback processes. Um, I don't really know, but it's definitely something that caught our attention. It's something I am very curious about, and we intend to look um, closer into this in the future. In fact, uh, Camila de Safreitas, who is um, co-chairing uh, today's Hipatia, is already doing a great job exploring a couple of aspects in this direction. Yeah, and with this, I'm already at the end of my talk. Um, to sum up as a take home message, uh, I would like to say that based on our measurements of stellar kinematics and stellar population properties, yeah, the nuclear disks in time really seem consistent with what we expect um, from bar-driven secular evolution from a bar-driven 
formation scenario. In this context, nuclear rings quite simply seem to be the gaseous star forming outer edges of nuclear disks. And based on this realization and the radial age profiles, we infer, we propose that nuclear disks um, form in an inside out formation scenario from a series of star forming nuclear rings with increasing radii. And last but not least, it's made us curious uh, to have a closer look at the prevalence of classical bulges in the local universe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Adrian, for that uh, great talk. So now I'm going to pass it over to Camila, who is going to be fielding your questions. Camila, take it away. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we already have questions, so I'm going to ask to uh, Rainer Pelletier to unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Yes. Um, thank you very much, um, Adrian. Um, I, I'm, I like this, this result a lot. But um, can, can I ask you about the title of your talk? You say these are Milky Way-like galaxies. So what was the morphological type distribution of the galaxies? And then secondly, if you look at the Milky Way, would you, from the analogy, then think that the Milky Way does not have any classical bulge? Um, so... For the selection of the timer sample, we um, basically focused on massive disk galaxies in the, in the local universe. The um, uh, criterion here was for those galaxies to be barred and to show some um, photometric signatures of these um, central substructures, be it nuclear disks, nuclear rings, or inner bars. So I think it's at least fair to say um, that the galaxies we have in Timer are, um, yeah, similar to the Milky Way. Uh, yeah, regarding the morphological types, um, we are basically having, um, yeah, from S0, SA, SB, um, okay. early type uh, Everything. galaxies. Yeah. Um, now about the Milky Way, I mean, for me as somebody focusing on extragalactic galaxies. I'm certainly not an expert here. Maybe um, uh, Francesca, she knows these things certainly much better than me. Uh, but I think currently um, we believe that there is, that we do see these um, bar built structures in the Milky Way. There should be a star forming nuclear ring. There should be a nuclear disk. Yeah. But to the best of my knowledge, there is so far, yeah, very little evidence of the Milky Way having a massive classical bulge. Good, thank you. Okay, uh, now uh, if Peter Ervin, please unmute yourself. You can make your question. Hi, Adrian. Um, that was a very nice talk. Um, I only want to introduce a, a note of skepticism about your outside inside out formation from the nuclear rings. And the reason is that in star, star forming nuclear rings in nearby barred galaxies are usually not at the outer edge of the nuclear disks. They are inside, they are within, let's say a third to half the radius of the nuclear disk. And if I remember from your paper, you define the outer edge of the nuclear disks just from where the velocity to the velocity dispersion reached a maximum and not from an actual photometric or morphological analysis. So I, I, can, I can you know, give you like NTC 1300 is a galaxy in timer where there is a nuke star forming nuclear ring and there is a very clear nuclear disk and the nuclear disk extends to about twice the radius of the nuclear ring. So just in that sense, I would be skeptical of that particular argument. Yeah, so... Um... It's true um, when defining this um, radius of the nuclear rings, we are having a look at um, the radial profiles of V over sigma um, and basically identifying the radius at which this V over sigma peaks in the radial range of these um, nuclear disks. So there's no um, photometric argument in that sense, um, but 
eventually I would also be not terribly surprised if the nuclear disk extends a little bit um, outside of uh, the nuclear rings. Because if there's a lot of star formation going on in these nuclear rings with a lot of gas being evident there, it should also be pushed to larger radii. And hence, there might be a little bit of nuclear disks forming even, even beyond the star forming um, nuclear ring. Well, my counter argument would be that there are definitely nuclear disks which extend significantly further out than the ring, than the star forming ring. And there's also the possibility that your V over sigma measurement could be a bit biased by the nuclear ring. The idea being that if the nuclear ring is where, the, is where you have the coldest, kinematically coldest stars that have just formed, so they're closest to circular motion, lowest dispersion, that might bias the peak of your V over sigma measurement. Whereas the, if the rest of the nuclear disk is a bit older, a bit kinematically hotter, then V over sigma might not be the best measurement of the size of the nuclear disk? Um, that might indeed be the case for those galaxies showing um, yeah, nuclear rings with strong ongoing star formation. Um, yeah, I mean, eventually, I don't know, it's certainly something that would be very interesting uh, to look into and repeat this exercise um, yeah, based on photometric arguments to define the uh, nuclear disk and nuclear ring size, and also maybe um, extend this to a to a large sample to really um, get a closer, yeah, to get a better overview of all the different of, of nuclear rings at different ages, young ones, old ones, and um, their different host galaxies. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. We are out of time now and we are going to move on to the second talk today. Thank you, Adrian. So great, so today for our second talk, uh, our second speaker is Bas Sautendijk. I hope I pronounced that right. So um, Bas will be telling us about how to constrain the properties of dark matter by exploring ultra faint dwarf galaxies. Uh, Bas, please feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, so uh, Bas is currently doing his PhD at Leiden University and is interested in the nature and properties of dark matter. Um, and he's using the MUSE instrument on the, ELT, on the VLT to uh, study this. Before uh, starting his PhD, he did his master's and bachelor thesis also in Leiden, where he specialized in cosmology. So uh, take it away, Bas. You're muted. Please unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me begin by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about constraining dark matter with ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, where I'll be presenting um, results from the MUSE faint survey. That, of course, is not a project I'm doing alone, so I would like to start with a shout out to my collaborators or my main collaborators, Viola Brinkman, Mariano Julio, and Daniel Vage are all members of the MUSE faint team who are also working on dark matter and Marco Regis and Marco Tooso are external collaborators whose work will also feature in this talk. So why would anyone want to constrain dark matter? Dark matter is, at least in the Lambda CDM paradigm, the most dominant component at the scale of galaxies. And for a large part of cosmic history, the dominant component for the entire universe. So dark matter is very important to understand the evolution of galaxies and the universe as a whole. Understanding what dark matter is also has the potential to revolutionize physics because if dark matter is some new kind of particle that goes beyond the standard model that has all kinds of implications for the way we understand particle physics. Also, alternatively, if dark matter turns out to be not actually a particle 
but just a, an apparent effect that is caused by different laws of physics, like modified Newtonian dynamics, they would also have a large impact on their understanding of the basic laws of physics. A third point here, more philosophically, um, understanding our universe, I think, is a very human question. Humans have been asking themselves how the world works for a very long time. And trying to understand the main components of our universe is therefore also in a philosophical way, a very important question to address. Now, why I want to use older friend dwarf galaxies for to answer or try to constrain this, this question better is because as we all know, in a purely cold dark matter universe, all the dark matter halos form N of W profiles. But in reality, we have baryons and these alter the profiles of galaxies and might also give um, other effect signals that might confuse us when we try to constrain the nature and the properties of dark matter. Ultra faint dwarf galaxies are nothing but the very, very faintest galaxies that we know. And these are very much dark matter dominated. That means that there is very little effect from these baryons. So we have the best chance of observing something that is as close as possible to its pristine um, dark matter origins. So um, in this talk, I'll be mentioning a few types of dark matter. There are many more than I'm highlighting here, but I would like to explain you these. Of course, cold dark matter you are familiar with. Um, this could be made from a number of different kinds of particles. Um, there's weakly interacting massive particles, which are, for example, possible supersymmetric particles. There's the, exa the almost exact opposite, massive complex objects like primordial black holes. And then axions, a third category, um, that are another kind of elementary particle introduced to solve some of quantum mechanics um, problems. But it turns out that it's also a very interesting dark matter candidate. So why not solve two problems with one particle? And there's also self-interacting dark matter where dark matter still interacts uh, naturally with um, baryons, but has a, an important interaction with other dark matter particles. This can be some kind of scattering or it can be annihilation. I'll be focusing on annihilation in this talk. And then lastly, fuzzy dark matter is made of ultralight particles um, where quantum effects start to appear on astronomical scales because the, the Broglie wavelength is parsecs or even larger in size. These can be uh, action light particles. They don't have to be. You often see action mass in papers talking about fuzzy dark matter, but it can be any ultralight boson. So I will first go through a few results from the literature to show like how other people have already uh, constrained dark matter using ultra faint dwarf galaxies. This is not at all a complete review because of reasons of time. If anyone in the audience feels left out, then I apologize. First, um, machos have been constrained um, before using ultra faint dwarf galaxies using here on the left constraints from the U of the Eridanus 2. This seems to this galaxy seems to host a star cluster. And if your dark matter halo is full of these heavy complex objects, they will disturb the stars in this cluster and it should disintegrate. We still see a star cluster, it hasn't disintegrated, so it gives you constraints on the mass and the abundance of um, of machos as a form of dark matter. And you can see that um, machos of 10 to 100 or 1,000 solar masses uh, are ruled out as being all of dark matter. And it nicely lines up with 
the microlens constraint from Maxone Eros. On the right, another dwarf, ultra faint dwarf galaxy, Segway 1, um, with the similar mechanism, the uh, machos would um, kick out stars from the center of this galaxy, basically leaving a hole in your stellar distribution that is not seen. Therefore, we can constrain the mass abundance of matches. For annihilating self-interacting dark matter, there are strong constraints from uh, gamma ray surveys here with Fermilat and MAGIC. Um, the Fermilat observations here are actually from larger dwarf galaxies, but MAGIC observes Segway 1, that same galaxy I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, you can see that this um, rules out certain uh, values of the um, interaction cross-section and it even goes down as far as the thermorelic cross-section in some dark matter masses. Below here, um, this theory becomes a lot less interesting because you would expect, uh, if dark matter is produced thermally, you would expect to, it to be um, around this limit here. And lastly, for fuzzy dark matter, um, there are also constraints based on the readiness 2 and its star cluster. Um, one of the quantum effects of fuzzy dark matter is that the density in the center of the halo will actually fluctuate. And these fluctuations will also disturb the stars in the star cluster. And that basically limits um, the, um, the mass of the um, ultralight particle to larger than 10 to the minus 19 electron volts if uh, fuzzy dark matter is all of dark matter. These two results find, uh, these two um, papers find um, compatible results in this case. Also interesting to note is that below or much below 10 to the minus 21, you will not expect a dark matter halo the size of Eridanus 2 to form. Um, that's also interesting because uh, dark matter of a mass of 10 to the minus 22 electron volts has been proposed as um, a solution to the core cost problem in larger dwarf galaxies. But that does not seem to be consistent with Eridanus 2. Now I want to continue with my results. First, um, MuseFaint is the survey I'm using, using the Muse instrument on the Very Large Telescope. The PI is Jarl Brinkman. It's a 100 hour survey using GTO time because we are part of the Muse collaboration. Muse has a one by one arc minute uh, field of view. That's a very nice size to target ultra fine dwarf galaxies as most of these are around this, um, have a half light radius on the sky of around this value or a small multiple. So we can cover them in only a few pointings. And because MUSE is an integral field unit, it can capture spectra of every source you have in the image. You don't need to do any pre-selection. Um, you have a very, or compared to fiber spectra, so you have a very high density of spectral elements um, to target the stars in these very dense stellar systems. You can see here the, um, source selection for Muse Faint, also compared with uh, classical dwarf galaxies, and this spans a range of half-light radii and absolute magnitudes, and then hopefully also um, masses of these systems to get a, um, a varied view of different uh, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. The two ultra-faint dwarf galaxies that I'll be talking about in this talk are Eridin Su and Liu Qi. These are um, two of the larger ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. In fact, Liu Qi might not actually be an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy depending on your definition. It's right at the boundary. Um, so these have um, absolute feedback magnitudes of minus 7.1 for Eridin Su and minus eight for Liu Qi. To put that into context, hypergiant stars are brighter than these entire galaxies. That's how faint these galaxies are. So you can see them 
source selection in these galaxies for Muse Faint, um, we combined with literature data at larger radii from the fiber spectrographs, we have about 100 sources um, members of these systems per galaxy. That will give us a nice sample to analyze. First, um, constraining machos with readiness two. Uh, I already showed you the, um, the literature constraints. Um, the main question in this paper wasn't to um, rederive these constraints that had, those have been done before, but that this star cluster that appears to be in readiness two, I've highlighted it here. There was no spectroscopy on this uh, set of stars. So we actually didn't know for sure whether this is part of witness two, whether it is just seen in projection. Uh, is it in the center? Is it um, orbiting around it? Um, so in this, um, in this study, we found that the systemic velocities of the cluster and uh, the rest of witness two are very much consistent with each other. And there is a small uh, difference in the dispersion, although the uncertainties are large. And then using a formalism um, developed by Grant, um, where you have basically have big massive machos um, giving off energy, kinetic energy to the stars um, in multiple body interactions um, that will, um, will leave the stars with a higher velocity, making them move to larger radii. So slowly, this star cluster, if it is embedded in a dark matter halo full of machos, will start to dissolve. Um, when we do the calculation, we find results that are very similar to those of Grant, but now we have also uh, measurements of the of the cluster, so we could replace some of the assumptions that Grant had to do. Um, so these are one and two sigma limits in the plane of mass of machos and macho abundance, where here zero is 100 um, percent. And if you overlay that with the macho and errors results, we again see that this is very complementary. Then um, with Leo T, we did a study of um, constraining action-like particles as a form of dark matter. Action-like particles can decay into two photons, and these photons might arrive at our telescope. The wavelength of the emission lines that we then observe will give us the mass of the axions, and the strength of those emission lines are given by the coupling between axions and photons, or basically the decay rate of axions into photons. So in this study, we don't actually study the stars in the ultrafine dwarf galaxies, but we look for light in between the stars. So even where there seems to be no data, there is still data. In this study, uh, which was led by Marco Regis and Marco Toho, so um, we found that um, based on the amount of light that we see coming from uh, the background lights that we see coming from Leo T. We can say that these um, emission lines of actions, if they're there, must be below this level. And that gives us a constraint on uh, action like particle masses. Note that this is a very different mass range than these ultralight particles. Here we're talking about a few EVs instead of 10 to the minus 20 or minus 22. And here the strength of the coupling between action-like particles and photons. So this is a few orders of magnitude stronger than existing bounds in this mass range, which are from other uh, sources than ultrafine dwarf galaxies. So unfortunately, um, this is a quite small mass range, but that's just because we are limited to the observing wavelength range of our telescope. Now, the last uh, paper I want to uh, highlight here 
it came out recently. It's been on archive since January. And the results I'm showing here have actually been updated. And the paper will also be updated in the course of next week. So if you check online now, you will find that numbers are slightly different. So don't panic. Um, here we um, study um, the density profile of Verdens 2 deep into its half-light radius, which is indicated with the line here. You can see the positions of the stars with the markers on the bottom. So the velocities of the stars, velocities we can measure from the spectra that we get with Muse, are um, given by the genes equations and originate from the ma enclosed mass in these galaxies. So that's why we can convert from the velocities into density profiles. Here we fit three different density profiles to the velocities for cold dark matter, annihilating self-interacting dark matter, and fuzzy dark matter. You can see that there is quite some uncertainty, especially in the center where the data starts to becoming sparse. Um, but overall, a good agreement, as you would expect. Um, we find that fuzzy dark matter here is the best fit, but it's not significant. So we cannot use this to rule out any kind of dark matter. But we can also look at the um, properties of the dark matter because these are related to the shape of the uh, profile. So self-interaction dark matter has, or at least in the in this annihilating form, has a quartz shape instead of the cuspy NFW shape. So the um, the um, mass goes uh, is constant in the center because um, in the center where the density of dark matter is highest, you have the most interactions, so the most annihilations of the dark matter. So the density, especially in the center, starts to decrease. And that's why we have this um, lower density in the center. Fuzzy dark matter, on the other hand, its quantum effects um, mean that there is a quantum pressure um, preventing a gravitational collapse of the system and that actually increases the density um, at these radii. But then in the very center, again, there is a core that's outside of the range that we can probe here. Um, so first, going to self-interacting dark matter. So the amount of coordinates will tell us the strength of the interactions of the dark matter. We find that the interaction rate translates into a cross-section per unit mass, that is 10 to the minus 36 um, square centimeter per electron rule. That's an upper limit um, because we cannot rule out that there might be um, smaller uh, cores that we just cannot probe because we lack um, information at those radii. This upper limit is nowhere near as strong as those from gamma rays. But the benefit of this limit is that it is independent of what the dark matter annihilates into. Um, we saw um, in the, the magic and Fermilat uh, results that I showed, there this decay channel was uh, bottom anti bottom decay. And the constraints actually change quite uh, slightly if you choose a different reaction. That's not the case here. It's valid for any annihilation process um, for this dark matter. So for fuzzy dark matter, the results are actually um, a lot more interesting. Um, we find that the mass of the um, ultralight particle must be larger than 10 to the minus 20.40 electron volts at 95% confidence. That is consistent with the constraints found um, for Everness 2 based on uh, the survival of its cluster, but it's not consistent with the result I mentioned earlier, the 10 to the minus 22 that seems to fit the cores of larger dwarf galaxies. So this is kind of um, a problem for fuzzy dark matter, um, at, at least in its ability to to account for uh, for the cores of dwarf galaxies 
uh, without invoking baryonic physics, because it seems that these different dwarf galaxies prefer different masses that are incompatible. So one possibility is that um, these brighter dwarf galaxies, although you can fit them very well with fuzzy dark matter, might not be explained by fuzzy dark matter. So that, for example, the cores are baryonic in nature or some other process. Um, of course, this is only one galaxy, Ridden's two that we've studied now. Um, so it would, of course, become a much, lot stronger if we can repeat this exercise for multiple dwarf galaxies. Uh, that's also why I want to end with an outlook for the near and slightly further future. I've shown you results from the Muse Faint survey um, based on only two galaxies, Eridanus 2 and Liu T. So we have a sample of 10 ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So if we fully exploit those, um, we can expect these constraints to be stronger, to have corroboration from different sources. Um, so we'll rule out that there is some kind of anomalous um, dwarf galaxy in between there that um, skews our, our results. We might also be able to uh, start looking for trends with different halo and stellar masses in our sample. Then um, on a bit larger time scale, um, we can expect to um, increase the number of stars we can observe in ultra faint dwarf galaxies uh, using new facilities that are coming up. Blue Muse is an instrument under development for the VLT, which will have a larger um, field of view than Muse and will observe in bluer wavelengths. So this larger field of view would be very nice to target the larger ultra faint dwarf galaxies or the ones that, are, that appear larger on the sky that are not efficient to target with Muse at the moment. Also telescopes like the ELT will of course, um, enable us to go to fainter stars and in that way increase our the numbers and the statistics that we have. And lastly, large surveys like the LSST um, will find more ultrafine dwarf galaxies in the future. With that, I want to end and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bas. Um, let's take it away for questions then. Uh, Camila? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, well, we are waiting for people to have their questions and also waiting for the delay on YouTube. I'd like you to know what are your expectations using maybe the Blue Muse? What do you think could increase your analysis with this? Um. Well, it's not, um, I wouldn't propose to reobserve the galaxies that we have now because these are fine to observe with Muse. It's just that um, some of the ultra faint dwarf galaxies um, are inefficient to target at the moment because of their extent on the sky. As one square argument is huge for an IFU, but still not that large if you compare it to uh, to the size of many galaxies. So Blue Muse would mostly be a way to um, to target different ultra faint dwarf galaxies. Okay, thank you. Um, we're still waiting. It seems like we had a problem with the streaming on YouTube, so it might take a little bit longer to them. Um, uh, okay, we have a question here on Zoom from Anna. You can unmute yourself and go on, please. Hello. Um, I'm, I was a bit confused about your definition of self-interacting dark matter as either scattering or annihilating. It was my impression that you can have a, an annihilating WIMP um, as a cold dark matter particle as well. Um, so I don't know, can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, I've, I've been confused by this myself as well. Um, I think there is some 
ambiguity in the literature as to how this is defined. Um, so in the, um, the sources or the, in the profile that I used for, for this study, the authors called it self-interaction dark matter. Um, so that's what I've also used in the paper. I realized that when people say self-interaction dark matter, that's, they usually mean scattering dark matter. Um, and yes, if you have um, a WIMP with a self-interaction that is annihilating, um, I guess it's just a, a matter of how self or how strongly annihilating this is. If the annihilation is strong enough, you will start to see an effect on the density profile and it will not be an NLW. If it's small um, or neg negligible, then you still see an NLW profile. So I think there is also some overlap between these categories. Um, I think, think there is also some interest in uh, connecting um, the density profiles of dwarf galaxies with um, the exact interaction cross-section for, for scattering self-interacting dark matter. Is that something you might look into as well? Um, so in principle, um, scattering um, dark matter will also um, alter the, um, the density profile of an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy. The shape will be a bit different than uh, the profile I've shown here for self-interaction dark matter, uh, but uh, this can be done in a, in a similar way. Um, I wouldn't know it on the top of my head um, whether this is going to be a competitive result to other experiments looking for um, the cross-section of scattering dark matter, but it's certainly something that is possible. Um, but I had to limit the number of profiles um, in these uh, papers for reasons of time, of course. Thanks. Okay, uh, I guess we are out of time now. I ask for people that had more questions to please get in touch with Bas. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I pass now for Giacomo so he can close uh, the session. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Well, I saw that Pavel, Pavel Krupa wanted to make a question, so we can, sorry, Camila, we can leave uh, one minute more because, you know, Pavel, we, Pavel, are you, are you there? Do you, do you, can you, would you want to make a question? No, he left, he left. Ah, sorry about that. No, no, fine, but you did, did great. No, no, just, uh, I, I want, I, I saw that there was a, ah, Maria, Maria, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm with my baby. Uh, she's a little loud, but um, I had two quick questions. One, what was the redshift range of your ultra uh, diffuse dwarf galaxy, ultra faint dwarf galaxies? And have you ever considered the ultra faint larger galaxies, like ultra diffuse galaxies in Coma Cluster and Virgo Cluster in your dark matter studies? Um, thank you. So the um, ultra faint dwarf galaxies that I'm studying here are all satellites of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so that's the, the redshift is basically zero. Um, I think I once calculated it at about 10 to the minus five. Um, whether we can do this with ultra diffuse galaxies as well, um, it's not something that we are planning with Muse Faint. Um, other people have um, have looked at ultra diffuse galaxies for the um, nature of dark matter. Actually, one of the papers I mentioned, Broadhurst et al., uh, where they find a 10 to the minus 22 electron volts fuzzy dark matter is based on an ultra diffuse galaxy. Um, I cannot really comment more on this because I have not looked into uh, ultra diffuse galaxies myself. Thank you. Yeah, faint universe is very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks. So maybe maybe very very last question. The, the, yeah, there is a question from Cohen on, on on from from the chat. 
So I can read it for you, Bas, is uh, how far down the stellar luminosity function would you able to go with larger telescope like the ELT to sample more stars in the center region of these dwarfs? So I haven't calculated how, um, how far down we would uh, be able to go with a large telescope like the ELT. Um, and well, we are not yet preparing observations, so uh, I have not um, done any of the exposure calculations. Um, but I can tell you how far we can go now with, uh, with MUSE, and that's um, magnitude 24 in the R band. Um, so perhaps um, we can uh, do some calculations. But this is with magnitude 24 and R band, we, can, we are just sequence. Um, so that's, um, there's definitely- Really, thank you. Thank you very much, Camila. And uh, with this, I also want to apologize because what happened, why I, you didn't realize, but basically Zoom crashed twice on my on my. So this is great. So let me thank uh, again, Adrian and, and Bas for the excellent talk. And again, for giving, you know, this beautiful, uh, review or their job, and also again for Camila and uh, Francisca who uh, chaired the session. And let me thank everyone who participated to the to the event.